Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti a questo momento speciale, questo incontro con il Premio Vision Award 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, good afternoon, welcome to this very special meeting. The, as you know, it will be time for a conversation with uh, the recipient of the Vision Award 2016. You surely have met him yesterday night on the piazza. I'm very thrilled to introduce to you. Well, first of all, I introduce you the moderator of this conversation. I call on stage Peter Cowie. Thanks for being with us. Peter is working. Uh, we have very good on, on the recipient work, so I'm very happy to have him moderating this conversation. And then, of course, the, the guest of this afternoon, please welcome Mr. Overshaw. and please ask questions. So Howard, everyone here likes you, loves you for the enduring music you wrote for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. But what's so good about this afternoon's event is that the clips we'll show, the conversation we'll have will underline the immense range of your achievement over 90 feature films, all the way from the earliest Cronenberg pictures to this year's Academy Award winner Spotlight. And if I may, I thought we could start talking about your early years. You, I think you told me once that you began writing music as early as 10, is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. And then, and then the, the next stage for me, the big stage in your career, was going up to Berkeley uh, yes. College of Music in Massachusetts, one of the finest colleges in the world, particularly for jazz, yes. with people like uh, alumni like Quincy Jones, Al Di Miola, and even Nina Simone was refused a place there. So, what, what, was it worthwhile spending that time? Would you recommend that to young composers? Uh, yes. The, uh, those early years I had a very good, uh, I was a young uh, clarinet student and uh, the teacher I had, uh, Morris Weinswag, his brother was John Weinswag. If you're, for, uh, he was one of the finest Canadian composers of the 20th century, I mean, the premier composer. And uh, I, I didn't know that at the time, but so his brother thought the young student, the woodwind student, should learn harmony and counterpoint. And I still have the little thesauruses, the little books that I worked on. So each week was uh, a lesson in uh, clarinet and then in counterpoint and harmony. And he got me writing with a pencil very early on. And really the pencil has just kept going. And, and then I played a lot of woodwind instruments. I did a lot of different things in music, put down the instruments and then kept the pencil going. How long were you there? Uh, well, for in Berkeley. Well, this was, this was when I was 10. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then Berkeley was uh, kind of uh, opened up the doors to uh, uh, just an adventure of music. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a student that uh, was quiet in a way, and I just want, you know, just observing everything. And I had great teachers in harmony and uh, orchestration, arranging. Um, I was studying saxophone at the time, and uh, my teacher, Joe Violo, is a great teacher. Uh, he, uh, he, he always asked me when I came in for the class how the composition was going. <laughs> so I think he probably knew that that was a, a good route for me. And what, and, but I, for years I played uh, professionally saxophone, and I made a living doing that for many years. And then, of course, you uh, joined, co-founded with some friends, the Lighthouse Group, which was uh, an immensely successful rock yeah. band. Just called Canada, Lighthouse. In Canada, yeah. Just called Lighthouse. Yeah. And then you did up to a thousand gigs in four years? Uh, we did 251 nighters a year, approximately. We played like five concerts uh, a week. 
for, uh, for many years, and we toured extensively, and we uh, uh, toured with the uh, Grateful Dead, uh, Big Brother and the Holding Company, Janis Joplin, we toured with Jefferson Airplane, we did small mini tours with them. We played at the Isle of Wight, we opened for Jimi Hendrix at the Isle of Wight in 1970. Uh, so I had a whole career in uh, recording, we did eight albums, and I was in the studio quite young, and I was also writing music for orchestra at that point, and it was the period of uh, Procol Harum and uh, Moody Blues, the idea of using orchestra mm -hmm. with rock groups, so we were, I wrote uh, and contributed to a, a rock ballet that my friends did. But, you know, gro growing up in Canada was fortunate in the sense that uh, the CBC was very generous with young uh, young musicians, young talent in general. So at a very young age, um, I kind of just walked into CBC mm -hmm. and just said, I'm a young uh, songwriter. And they said, okay, well, here's a, a little, they gave me a little office. It was like a broom closet, had a whole big upright uh, Victorian piano in it. And I would go in there and write. And they used me occasionally for writing uh, radio shows. I did radio dramas and uh, radio comedy shows, you know, and writing incidental music. And then I did documentaries, a lot of nature films, mm -hmm. and then that kind of transitioned into television, mm -hmm. into variety television in Canada, specials, uh, with my friend Lord Michaels and a lot of other uh, friends of ours were doing these shows in Canada, and then that eventually led to New York, and Saturday Night Live, which yeah, which is a show that's been on in America for over 40 years. And uh, you were the first band leader, right? I was the uh, well, one of the original, you know, creators of yeah. the show. It's a small group. It started with I think about three people, and then expanded to 12 and maybe 15 with the original cast. And I wrote the original music for the show, and then stayed with it for uh, five years. 75 to 80. And each week you would meet early in the week to decide what was going to be staged on Saturday? You, you would create a live show week by week. Mm. Yes, it was a very exciting period and uh, we did, tried a lot of different things on stage and you know it was uh, a theatrical show, it was on very late and uh, the comedy show was sketches and music mm. and I think not many people realize that you gave Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi the name, the Blues Brothers, when you created that band. Well, the, we used to do a warm-up for the show. Uh, that was uh, about a 30-minute warm-up, to be honest. But the show would broadcast at 11.30. The audience would come in, and we would have uh, uh, comedians do stand-up, you know, work with the audience to kind of work, you know, get them in a mood for watching the show. And of course, we were playing music all the time through this. And the band that I originally created for the show was based in R&B, in Stax Folds, in the blues, essentially, American blues, and uh, which was something I really loved. And uh, the uh, Dan Aykroyd, so we would warm up and Dan Aykroyd played a little bit of blues harmonica and he wanted to join in and play with the band. I said, sure, and I used to have him come up and play with us. And then of course John Belushi wanted to join in as well. And so I would introduce them as those brothers in blues, the Blues Brothers. And I think that kind of stuck. And then they went off and did movies and records. And Which concerts. was coming to the on Wednesday afternoon in that that train that winds through the valley, yeah. the fart train, a man was sitting opposite us wearing a Blues Brother t shirt. <laughs> so I thought I would raise that. It's so iconic now. You yeah. see those, those hats and those little ties everywhere. Oh. The other big meeting that must have been very important for you in Canada was with David Cronenberg. Yes. And I think you had you were aware of him before you met him, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. So